All right, good morning, everyone. It's noon, so we'll go ahead and kick off and get started this morning. Um, hello and welcome to the Emerging Markets Are Here as your data ready webinar. My name is Rachel Peabody and I'm the Director of Communications at the Illinois Soybean Association. Please join me in thanking our corporate partner Farm Mobile for sponsoring our webinar today. The webinar will be recorded and available on ISA's YouTube channel. If you have questions during the webinar, please feel free to type them into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and we will answer those following the presentation. So now I'd like to introduce our speakers today. Leading today's conversation on emerging markets and data is Steve Cubbage, Vice President of Services at Farm Mobile. Farm Mobile is an independent ag data company based in Leewood, Kansas, and they specialize in collecting, organizing, and standardizing agronomic and machine data for farmers, ag retailers, and trusted partners. And they do that in real time across a mixed fleet of iron, and the technology gives users full control, ownership, and access to the data. Steve has a background in precision agriculture with roots back to 1999 when he created his own pre precision agronomy services firm, Record Harvest. He's a fourth generation farmer with degrees in ag economics and journalism. Steve also serves as a frequent industry speaker and a columnist for Farm Journal's The Scoop. At Farm Mobile, Steve is focused on helping farmers and their trusted advisors collect and then extract that meaningful value from the agronomic and machine data they collect. We also have Jacob Winans, Technology Agronomy Information Specialist for Brandt, and ISA's Michael Gill, the Director of Conservation Agriculture. Jacob Winans joined Brandt in 2016, and he serves as an Information Specialist for Precision Agriculture and Data Management. He also helps support the 24 Brandt retail locations. Before joining Brandt, Jacob worked for Monsanto in the Technology Pipeline Solutions team, and he's also worked for 10 years in the seed industry. Michael Gill is ISA's Director of Conservation Ag and joined the ISA team in January of this year. He's a certified professional agronomist and a CCA. Michael's also earned a Bachelor of Science in Field Biology and a Master of Science in Ag Industries and Soil Fertility. In his role, Gill works on behalf of farmers in the development and implementation of conservation agricultural research and supports those research efforts at the farm level. He also leads demonstration of conservation agriculture practices to Illinois' 43,000 soybean farmers. Today, our speakers will be presenting Emerging Markets Are Here, Is Your Data Ready? And they will teach attendees about new market opportunities and explain why data is so crucial, go over tips on what types of data growers need to be collecting, and help you discover how you can work more efficiently with your ag partners, advisors, and data technology now to get ready. Please join me in welcoming Steve, Jacob, and Michael. Thank you, Rachel, for that introduction. And certainly we're here today to talk about emerging markets and, and one of the hot topics in those emerging markets categories is obviously carbon and carbon credits. And that's one of gonna be the focus here today. And before I go any further, I'd certainly like to thank the Illinois Soybean Association and its board and, and certainly its members for this opportunity to present to you here today. And before we go any further, one of the things we'd like to do is just get some participation right off the bat from the audience as far as whether you've been approached to participate in a carbon market. And certainly uh, uh, you've heard a lot about this lately, but uh, I know that uh, there's already been some pilots out there. There's already been some signups of some, some makers out there. We certainly would love to, uh, to know whether or not if you've been uh, part of that. So, and we'll see these results as they come up come about and Claire will kind of post. So actually that's that's amazing that we've already seen that much of a, a penetration into the market over 27% uh, it, this early into the market. So that's, that's something that uh, obviously it is a hot topic and we're gonna talk about here today. And, you know, the headlines, You've seen them over the past three months. Uh, they've just continued to uh, spool up exponentially. And you've seen them come across, whether it be uh, headlines coming from big names like Bayer uh, that basically uh, are leveraging their Climate Corp uh, assets for the data. Land Lakes Microsoft, that was something that came across here in the past couple of months where Microsoft purchased over $2 million worth of carbon credits through uh, Land Lakes, and they're gonna be leveraging their True Terra program and creating a true carbon market is what they say. 
and obviously Nutrien, one of the larger uh, ag retail suppliers out there, announced their foray into the carbon space here a couple of months ago as well. But the list is, goes on and on. I think there's at least, uh, Farm Journal identified at least nine major players to date uh, in this carbon market, and I'm sure there's many more to follow. FBN, SIBO, NORI, uh, uh, or entities like ESMC, you're gonna to start to see these names and acronyms pop up quite a bit. And as we, we see that, I'd like to hear from Jacob and Michael, especially what they've been hearing as far as boots on the ground, uh, you know, in this space, you saw just the poll come up. Jacob, what, what have you been hearing from your farmers as uh, you've been talking with them? Yeah, that definitely falls in line with what we're seeing. Uh, it's kind of like nobody really had heard anything of it. And then all of a sudden we come back from, uh, you know, New Year's break or Christmas break. And all of a sudden, boom, you know, everybody's talking about this and what is it, you know, and a lot of questions. So, uh, yeah, we've definitely been in, uh, in discussions with a lot of different companies. Um, there's a bunch of companies out there, but I know four or five of them that have, you know, contacted us and we've had some really good discussions uh, mainly trying to learn, you know, what is all this? Why are, you know, what's going on here? And, you know, seeing the differences and, you know, not really taking a stance one way or the other and kind of sitting back and trying to get as much information for our growers. And our growers are now starting to ask us, you know, hey, can you help us navigate through this? Do you have my data? Number one, but number two, can you put your stamp on somebody? You know, so it's definitely a, uh, a new topic for all of us. Well, I, I certainly think so. I think, uh, Michael, you've been in this industry uh, for quite a while. And, and on the agronomy side, especially on the conservation side, what do you think uh, of, of this latest as far as mushroom cloud is that, that's happening in, in this space? Yeah, I, I think I describe it as chaotic, confusing, but exciting. Um, in the sense that it's chaotic because there's so many entities that have entered the market in this market space, both uh, for-profit companies and non-profit organizations like ourselves. Um, uh, confusing, just back to, to Jacob's point. I mean, when you start to read some of these contracts, um, there's, there's variation between contracts and the number of years you need to commit in how those payments will come across. And in some cases, if you don't receive full payment for what you're enrolling this year until five years out. Um, the, the situation of, of you know, the, in some cases, in a lot of cases, a lot of these companies are in a pilot type of mode. You know, they're just piloting the project in a certain area. And, <clears throat> and with that comes special offerings, you know, that you don't find that the end purchases of this, the non-ag sector, really want to go to and that's that fact of paying for practices that have been done in the past you know a lot of it is about additional practices over what you're offering now and the exciting part is is that i've, I've seen this marketplace try to launch before back in the early 2000s and and it, it just really did not go any place but with the excitement, the chaos that's going on, the number of people that are entering into this, the talk about climate change, um, it, the, the time is just ripe for this to happen. Right. And, and I think it's got a, a bright future to it. Well, I think that's a good, good lead into, you know, regardless of how or why, you know, this is truly happening. Uh, this is real. And ironically, this time, agriculture truly is at the center of a lot of what's happening. And, and a lot of that's got to happen at, at, at the field and grower level. And we're going to dive in just real quick, kind of give a little background to the audience of why this is happening now and what's the little history. And it, it comes down to almost a simple number, a two degrees Celsius. And, and for those of us who are metrically challenged, uh, that's about 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit. But this is the benchmark that was put forth by the Paris Climate Accord and the UN and the several nations that participated in the, the Paris Climate Accord in 2015 saying, based on pre-industrial levels, we could only allow uh, the average temperature of the atmosphere to rise by two degrees Celsius. Otherwise, bad things are gonna happen that, that things would, as far as 
rising sea levels, those type of things. But this was the benchmark that was put forth. So this kind of laid down the gauntlet and, and uh, countries across the world, and including the United States originally signed that. Obviously uh, that was put on moratorium during the Trump administration. But as you know, one of the first things signed on day one of the Biden administration was we're back into the uh, Paris Climate Accord. And uh, so all, all, you know, it, it just unleashed, they knew it was coming, uh, especially after the election. And, and there's been a lot of chatter. I think that's why a lot of chatters really spun up uh, since then. So, and at the end of the day, one of the things that's important, I think, is that this is a kind of a follow the money because it's interesting that this is, at least in the United States, this is all voluntary. These markets are a voluntary market. Uh, these, these companies are buying credits, not because they have to, but because they want to. And we'll explain a little more why. But I think the inter interesting takeaway from this slide, there's an uh, investment company called BlackRock. And those on Wall Street and, and in investment firms know this name very well. They, they control a lot of assets in the, in the uh, uh, marketplace or the financial marketplace. And their main focus when they're deciding on who to invest in and where to put their money is going to be companies that focus very heavily on climate change and, uh, and, make, uh, and going green. And so that's their primary investment strategy for 2021. And truthfully, this is a society driven piece. Uh, it's the people's choice. Uh, yeah, although it's voluntary, you know, you've got, uh, it's good PR. And you ask why are they spending money? It's because of public relations. This is, this is good advertising dollars being spent, making you look green and the millennial movement is voting with their dollars and they're voting with green dollars to, uh, to make sure companies that are, are following a green stance as they operate in the marketplace. So I don't know, obviously, are, are farmers starting to understand kind of the pressure that's, that's being mounted kind of from the top down, Jacob, that, that we're seeing here? Yeah, I think it's always been, you know, in the back of our minds that, you know, trying to do some better things, adopt some new, you know, strategies and do the right thing. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's one of them things right now we're all talking about it. But I mean, it, you know, we've been talking about this for, for ever since I, you know, started helping on the family farm. So I don't think it's anything new, but uh, right now it's definitely a hot topic. Yeah, so I think here, you know, going into this slide, and you know, I may have Michael comment on this just a little bit. This this slide is very telling. Is like why is why is agriculture at the center of this? Well, you know, being able to control that two degree rise uh, in in temperature, and a lot of it is reducing emissions and going you know electric cars, and and your next pickup may be electric as well, but. You know, you cannot basically uh, reduce your way out of, of, of these emissions. And the only way to really take carbon out of the atmosphere is have an industry like agriculture that is well suited because literally those plants uh, are, are able to pull that uh, out of the atmosphere, bank it in the soil, and deposit it in the soil. And if, if certain practice or practices are are done, basically that means that we can bank that uh, carbon for an extended period of time. So obviously this, you know, real quick, Michael, I mean, obviously you've seen this, but this is just basic uh, almost agronomy 101. It is, you know, and, and when we talk about greenhouse gases, we're not just talking about carbon dioxide. We're also talking about methane, which would come from livestock production. We're talking about nitrous oxide. That would be that, that, that loss of nitrogen through denitrification back into the atmosphere um, and by various other methods that, that uh, go on, possibly some of that through the, uh, the volatilization of, of gases from that manure and livestock again. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's all encompassing. And, 
and it it is one of those things, like you said, that that, that plant is a storehouse, and our soil is a storehouse, mm -hmm. and there's room for storage in both those situations. The more we can raise yield, uh, the the more likely we're to take more carbon out of out of the, the atmosphere. So there's a lot of things working in hand in hand, and and it has to do, you know, more of a holistic approach to the problem than it does looking at just any particular avenue of, of reducing carbon emissions and, yeah. and storing carbon. Well, that certainly sets up very nicely this this slide that that really shows that this is this this is really showing a world map of where uh, the best places in the world to to store that so, uh, carbon in the soil where where that can make the most uh, impact. And ironically, you see you know, here in the United States and also in, in Canada, uh, the darker brown is actually the ability to store more carbon. And it relates to about, you know, over at least a ton of carbon per acre. So, you know, if you look at that, the Corn Belt and especially Illinois is almost in the bullseye of, of the possibilities. And I think that's probably the reason, Jacob, that uh, you're getting a lot of questions because if you're a if you're looking to uh, bank carbon uh, in a soil, you're obviously probably looking in that corn belt. Yeah, region. definitely. The first time I saw that, I was like, man, they're blaming us for, you know, a lot of these problems. This isn't the blame map. This is the potential of what, you know, the areas that uh, could really move the needle on this. So, I mean, it's a good slide once you really study it, that's for sure. Yeah, this is, you know, one of my favorite slides that I've seen just really understanding you know, obviously there's been carbon lost in that soil or organic matter lost over the years, you know, and tilling that soil. But ironically, those soils also make the best carbon sponges. So I think, you know, moving forward, that's, you know, there's an asset here if, if we want to leverage it. So what we wanted to really focus on today, though, is, you know, what is it going to take to operate in this carbon market? And if you're the farmer, I mean, you know, what is going to be asked of you? And obviously there's going to be some practices that I think uh, we'll have Michael highlight here in a few minutes, but at the end of the day, they also uh, want kind of a history of what's happened on those fields and they want a continued history of what's happening on those fields. And that really boils down to a data buy and uh, field collected data is going to be uh, kind of a foundational piece to be able to operate and, and be able to sell in many of these carbon market markets. So we're going to talk about that. You know, how do we do that? How do we do that on a larger scale? Uh, at the end of the day, if you're a farmer, you're going to be asking the, you know, the Jerry Maguire question of uh, show me the money uh, with the right practices. You could, you could bank, you know, we're thinking on average of one ton of, you know, maybe a little less than that, depending on the practice, but, on average, one ton per of uh, carbon dioxide per acre. In the marketplace, we're seeing about a fifteen to twenty dollar a ton average. So you're looking at probably fifteen to twenty dollars a ton as far as uh, being paid as far as uh, per acre. And you know that's not always the case. We're gonna we've seen everything from two to three dollars to even thirty to forty dollars a ton. And there's going to be just a lot of opportunities, and and it's going to be very chaotic, but uh, it's, it's also going to be an opportunity for, for you to leverage uh, that land for something other than just growing crops. This is a, a slide we wanted to put in here because, you know, when we talk about data and especially field level collected data, it's very important that uh, we have, uh, you know, more, a more efficient way to do that. Uh, on the left, you see here, uh, what you see there is actually a Ziploc bag full of USB drives. And this is how data used to be collected and, and in many cases still is. And this isn't a terrible bad thing, but to be able to scale, we've got to move into more of a, a real-time world with cellular-based and cloud-based systems that you see here on the right. That And this is the farm mobile piece that that is able to go into some of these cabs and almost act at, like as a Fitbit uh, and uh, be able to stream that data, not only in real time, but also be able to share that data and, as well as protect that data uh, from those who pr are protected 
on behalf of those who create it. And that's you, the farmer in many cases, and, and obviously you, Jacob, on the retail side. But you've, you've lived this uh, bloody forehead uh, moment several times as far as collecting data. What, is, yeah. what does that mean, especially as we try to scale these type of markets? Yeah to, yeah, to move that needle. I mean, I've got my fair share of them Ziploc bags for sure right up here. You know, some of them I inherited from uh, the guy before me and uh, <laughs> I've sure added to the pile, but you're exactly right. I mean, we have to start, um, you know, trying to move to a, you know, a wireless uh, connectivity with those modems or whatever in there. Um, you know, trying to get all these systems to talk to each other is definitely a challenge. So that's, you know, a big part of that too. Well, Michael, you've lived this life a little bit too, and you're, you know, coming up through the ranks uh, in the precision ag side of things, you know, certainly, you know, how important is it to be able to start to actually scale this? Because, you know, uh, USB sticks and compact flashcards certainly, and, and PC-based software is certainly old school and doesn't lend itself well to these this marketplace. Yeah. Well, I think the current world, because we have data stored so many different places, and you know, when you enroll in a program such as, uh, you know, just whatever it may be, a carbon market program, it's it's you're piecemealing your data together, and and there's no direct way to, in in some cases, you're having to key it in using a keyboard, and and it's a huge time consumption, and and with that comes the fact that once you have all that data into that provider you've chosen. Are you going to be willing to move if you can get a better price per ton of carbon someplace else? Right. You know, and and so you know, a, a piece of equipment like Farm Mobile that that allows you to keep your data someplace where you have that freedom to move as the market changes. Um, you know, it's it's you know today, as I said, it's it's largely you're being asked to add a practice to be paid for uh, that carbon outcome. In, in the future, that may not necessarily be the case. Right. And, and so being, and it may not hit every provider that's, that's, that's purchasing those, those, those carbon credits. So you may want to move from one place to another with time. And, and so starting now where you can collect it someplace and store it in one spot is extremely important in my mind. Yeah. And so I think this lends itself that, that transitions very well. I mean, obviously, there's going to be some things that are asked as far as foundational layers and data layers that, that need to come from the farmer or the brewer themselves. I mean, obviously harvest and planting seems to be the bookends, uh, you know, planting date, uh, actual yield. Those are, we'll talk about those here at the close as far as definitely the check boxes you need. The other thing that's coming in, obviously they want to know what tillage practices or even lack thereof tillage practices and even machine data is coming in. But, the, you know, we wanted to certainly, there's a player in this piece that is equally and maybe more important, especially if they're your trusted advisor, because they may be shepherding both the grower and the ag retailer level uh, layers of data. And then there's going to be other data that comes into to this mix as well that needs to be compatible. But at the end of the day, basically, we call this, you know, at Farm Mobile, we call it the layers of the cake. And it's going to take a lot of ingredients in some cases to, to make uh, this cake on the carbon or, or some of these sustainability sites, much more so than maybe even in the past, as we, we need these additional layers uh, moving forth. And that's, you know, especially when you're talking about the ag retail side, one of the large components as far as impact in, in the carbon space is, is things like uh, nitrogen fertilizer and being able to know what that, how much you put on, when you put it on is very important. Talk to me a little bit, Jacob, as far as your side of things from brand standpoint and, and where you think you're headed with this as far as managing data, uh, you know, here in the future because of these markets. Yeah, definitely. I mean, this, this kind of validates what we've been, you know, doing for, you know, the past however many years, uh, you know, 10, 15 years of collecting data from the ag retailer, uh, collecting data from growers, 
um, you know, collecting it from our own equipment, plus, you know, like you're saying with the third party, you know, one thing that, you know, we implemented here a couple of years ago uh, was the farm mobile uh, device into our fleet. Um, we were collecting it from different sources, uh, but we saw, you know what, we need to, you know, have one file type, you know, one source that is our main source, and then all the other ones, you know, are kind of just, you know, for a backup or something. But one thing I want to point out is uh, that machine metrics. Yeah. So, you know, we really hadn't, you know, dove into that too much. Um, so, you know, when we first talked to you all, and uh, we started reaching out to other companies, you know, and of course, John Deere's doing it now. Um, you know, Case has got their uh, new AFS coming. Uh, but with that farm mobile, uh, it's collecting it on the whole rainbow of equipment we've got because we got commit or you know equipment that's all different colors all different monitors uh really you know stepped up our uh, data collection of ours you know be it fertility or spraying or uh you know that type of thing well i do think you know it's really interesting that you know you go with uh the data that you have but i think because you know, this data is starting to become available on the machines. Obviously, they have a carbon footprint very much so going across the field. And the efficiency of those machines are obviously important to you internally. But but even from a carbon standpoint, knowing time, knowing death levels, knowing, knowing transport time, being able to be more efficient, that's going to come into play. And I think it'll be of interest in this carbon market as well, because we've, we've already been asked that even ourselves at Farm Mobile from different players, you know, can you really, you know, capture this? Because before it was just an estimate and, you know, yeah. those that can prove it, I think they're going to have a leg up. Uh, you yeah. have both, both the agronomic and the machine side of things. So uh, with that, I'm going to let you expand, you know, obviously this is the maze that, uh, you know, a trusted advisor and, and, and what you have to help collect, this, this is not easy, and I'm sure, uh, uh, you know, this, this maze is probably a lot more complex than most even growers and, and especially others in the industry or outside the industry, uh, like some of these consumer product good companies think this data just uh, uh, magically appears. Yeah, they all connect and it's all just real easy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, <laughs> we, we've talked about that, uh, what's the commercial, the Staples Easy Button. You know, when I first came to Brandt, you know, we were all looking for that one size fits all platform. And, you know, we, we tried to develop one or, you know, are we trying to find one, you know, so we started looking. And uh, of course it doesn't exist or it doesn't exist yet that I've ever found. Uh, so, you know, you can kind of see the different avenues. And this is a slide we use all the time when we're talking to our growers, just trying to, you know, give them an opportunity to see all the different data sources that we can collect, what's out there, and then what we're doing with it. So, I mean, obviously, you can see that wireless data transfer uh, is becoming more and more. Uh, our percentage of growers that, you know, are moving this, this digital data uh, has definitely stepped up with wireless wireless transfer, yeah. but also we're getting that direct monitor data that we were talking about with those flash drives. Um, but that as applied data, um, you know, that's something that, you know, I think a lot of retailers were doing it uh, before, but there was a lot that weren't doing it. Mm -hmm. And I would, you know, give the advice to those ag retailers or co-ops that are, you know, not doing it. Um, you got to start somewhere. You know, mm -hmm. the importance of not being able to, you know, reproduce that historical data. And for example, you know, with this carbon market, we need to have, you know, some historical data. So you got to start somewhere. So, you know, you know, jump into one of these platforms and start collecting that as applied, uh, like we're asking our growers to do, you know, mm -hmm. so we need to do it a lot ourselves too. Yeah. So, but yeah, you can you can see um, yeah in this next slide a few uh, conservation things that have definitely uh, you know been in ag retailer for for a little while. Mm -hmm. um, 
and Steve, do you want to tee that up a little better? Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously the 4R piece is something that the Fertilizer Institute, which, you know, a lot of retailers are, are part of. The, I, I look at the 4R, you know, the right source, right rate, right time, right place as kind of being the training wheels that have that provide really good uh, uh, setup for these carbon markets, because it's obviously many of the retailers like yourselves have already been participating in that and been communicating this message down to, to the growers. And if, if you implement that, you're, you're well on your way to doing the things necessary to participate in these carbon markets. I think that's, you know, it's almost like you're almost 80% there. Here's the 20% more you may need to do to, to, to do that. And it's great to see your, you know, uh, brands and, and other retailers basically take this bull by the horns because this is a proactive stance that uh, allows us to, you know, stave off some of these uh, regulations that, that may hamper us in the future. But uh, it also, in this case, uh, gives us opportunity to, to leverage that and, and do something good for the growers as far as additional income. Yeah. Yeah. We definitely uh, have been a part of this 4R for, a, for quite a while. This past year, we may not have hit the total 4Rs, right? Uh, you know, we, we hit uh, two or three of them for sure, but you know, the right time uh, really was out of our control this year. Uh, but yeah, we've, you know, started to, you know, implement and that was something big and Brant when I came in, you know, was uh, everybody taking that 4R pledge uh, that, you know, the industry's, you know, kind of driving people to, but of course we use nitrogen stabilizers uh, right. in the fall as well. Uh, but also with this, you know, new chemistry label, uh, you know, we, we saw, a, saw a big shot of it with Dicamba, but the uh, information that we're collecting and having that, you know, right time, right place. That definitely is a huge conversation with everything, you know, new coming down the pike, yeah. uh, especially with new chemistries and that. I think, you know, we're going to be asked to do a lot more of this type of stuff. Awesome. Well, this really sets up, you know, this is, what are some of these other markets? What's beyond the carbon space? And I think this, this just shows you, you know, I, that's what I really wanted to bring Michael in and really kind of highlight these next couple of slides as far as the opportunities above and beyond maybe even the carbon space. So I'll let you kind of take it away and, and then we'll just keep rolling here, Michael. Sure. So the Illinois Soybean Association is in collaboration with several different associations in Illinois on two different projects. The first is the Soil and Water Outcome Fund. We are in a pilot year in Illinois. It is one of those stacked credit type uh, offerings where, where you're being paid for carbon credits on top of water quality credits. And those carbon credits often, oftentimes are purchased by uh, industry sectors outside of agriculture, but not always. You know, for instance, Nutrien is, is purchasing some of these credits. Um, you know, and then uh, the water quality credits, a lot of times those are, are being purchased by municipalities and other government agencies. Um, those are the primary purchases of those. But we've got 11 counties in Northern Illinois. You can see them on the map there. They encircle mm -hmm. Chicago up there, which gives us a great chance at, at trying to educate and get the legislators that live in that Chicago land area to understand agriculture better and what we're trying to do. So it, it opens up a great uh, opportunity for us, an opportunity for farmers that are farming in those areas. Uh, there's 20,000 acres that are involved here. It's not a huge number of acres this first year, but those acres just opened up for uh, uh, submittal where you can go in and submit fields uh, about a week ago now is, is awesome. when that started up, about March 2nd, I believe it was. Okay. And so it, it's, it's a stack credit paying anywhere from 25 to $40 per acre. So okay. when you get stack credits, it's a higher higher amount per acre is what you're going to see as far as payments concerned. Yeah, and I think that's a good point to make that in, in this case, in some of these cases, the, the carbon credit may be the, the lesser of the two in, in some cases, uh, in, in being able to maybe stack a water quality credit on top of that may be worth more than, in some cases, uh, than, than the carbon credit itself. So that's, 
being able to stack, I think is going to be uh, something that growers need to take a look out for. And you mentioned it down here that the outcomesfund.com as far as interested, uh, certainly check that out. And, you know, this is kind of the second piece of the conservation yeah. management group. Certainly uh, tell us a little bit more about that. And, yep. So the, the pre previous offering were in collaboration with Iowa Soybean Association. They've had the Soil and Water Outcome Fund for several years now. And it's been growing by leaps and bounds in Iowa. The second of these uh, collaborations we have is with Illinois Corn Growers, and that's PCM, which stands for Precision Conservation Management. And this is really the, uh, and it's it's initiated through funding through UDSDA. So it's really uh, helping farmers with the right practices for their farms and their fields, identifying funding that will help pay for those uh, those uh, practices that they're incorporating. Sorry. And this year um, is a year of expansion for us. So you can see in the map the, the area in red uh, mm -hmm. that has been Formerly, that's the base area that started in PCM. If you look at the, the series of circles, there's three different areas within Illinois where we're opening up acres uh, for this program uh, this year again. It, and it really is one of those things. It's not at any cost. And basically what the farmer gets out of it is guidance on putting those practices in and, and initiating those practices. He, he, he gets a, a, an opportunity of sourcing of funding for his, his practices that he's putting in. And then also he will, at the end of the year, get a report about the, the, his outcomes. So he will okay. find out at the end of the year, you know, just, just what did this mean from a, a greenhouse gas standpoint? And, you know, how do I rate in, uh, on, on, in these different areas compared to other farmers in the area? Uh, exactly. What can I do better uh, to, to gain higher ratings? And okay. I think it's all a, a, a process of, of learning that we're in, both about the markets and the opportunities that are there, with selling credits and also actually implementing these practices in the field. Very good. And so check out the precisionconservation.org uh, to learn more about that. You know, but, you know, this is kind of putting some things back to the audience now, just asking some of those questions. If you needed to share your data tomorrow, how would you do that? And, you know, at, especially when you're talking field level activity data as far as it's kind of the where's Waldo, where, where is that data? And, you know, these are the questions that we really, you know, you must have the data that, that these markets need. And so very simply, who has it? What kind of data do you currently have? And what kind of data will you need to have? And the bottom line, where is it? And I think that's an important piece as we go into this trusted advisor piece I, that we may, Jacob, I know that these are some, we'll talk about this on uh, another slide coming up, but certainly I think uh, from a trusted advisor standpoint, this is a uh, very key slide. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we, of course, you know, want to be that trusted advisor to, you know, all of our growers. Uh, some, you know, lean on us for that and uh, others, you know, try to navigate through themselves. But yeah, that's, that's definitely a, uh, a place where we can, you know, as ag retailers, step up and help yeah. uh, our growers. Very much so. I think the other thing that, that as far as the takeaway, if there's one slide in this deck, you know, this is going back to those ingredients or of, of data or as far as that layers of the cake, uh, as far as what these markets are really looking for. From what we've seen so far, I mean, it, it boils down to some very simple things having a correct digital field boundary, having, you know, accurate data as far as, you know, when you planted, when you sprayed, when you harvested uh, seed varieties, working with that ag retailer or trusted advisors, you know, making sure you have that key fertilizer spread data, not only, you know, what was spread, but how much and when and where, especially if it was verberated. And then make sure that that data is in, in, in good shape and, you know, one of the things these markets don't want to pay for data where they have to sort out your dirty laundry when it comes to, to data. And uh, field soil sampling, uh, it's going to be, for some of these markets, a very different type of soil sampling for, and like large cores, maybe down to at least a foot or more in depth. Uh, and so that's going to be a, a cost 
that that will be in, in, incurred as well. And then we've mentioned this machine metrics as far as, you know, if you have the opportunity to start collecting machine metrics, say like with a farm mobile device, it certainly will put you in a, a, a lead position for some of these emerging markets. You know, and at the end of the day, this data has to flow and, and the tech is now here to make that happen. You know, the farm mobile dashboard, being able to have that data that's yours, that you can share with multiple people and um, uh, focus on these tools and services that organize this data, collect it, and this agronomic flush machine data as it will certainly, I think over time become the norm. And um, I'll take, you know, Jacob's input here on this, but this is kind of his leave behinds as far as you need to collaborate with the trusted advisors, what that actually means and, and some things to watch out for. So I'll let you kind of, kind of go through yeah. this slide here, Jacob. Yeah, you know, and we hit this before, you know, as far as, you know, that trusted advisor uh, being your ag retail or co-op, maybe it's, you know, your agronomist or whoever you're talking to. But uh, one thing I pulled out, uh, you know, I wanted to look up and see how many companies are trying to uh, be in this carbon market. And I found one that said there's 237 different companies as of yesterday that are trying to be in this space in one form or another. So, I mean, none of us can know all about all these different companies. So, you know, that's one thing, you know, like with us, we're trying to, you know, you know, talk to our growers about, you know, who we think would be good, you know, you know, who to support, who, you know, that we really don't want to, you know, knowing that difference between, you know, selling historical credits that, that you would have done in this past year versus, you know, being with one of the companies that want to sell future credits. Right. So that's another big piece that we pulled out. And I think maybe uh, Michael or somebody brought it up, you know, earlier about, you know, that multi-year contract. Um, yeah. We've been reading through a lot of those and there's some big differences on, you know, to get paid out like what Michael was saying or, you know, is it, you know, if you were doing no-till before or cover crops right. before, you know, so there's a lot of different ones that we need to all uh, keep in mind. Uh, the other point, you know, I was talking about data grab, and I know that's a bad term uh, because everybody in the industry doesn't want to be that guy, uh, but that watch out. We've got to read these contracts now. We used to just, you know, click through them contracts, but uh, no of these companies, uh, I think that'll be pretty important. And like, you know, you guys were talking about the aggregate, um, that of course we don't in the, in this part of it, we don't want that to happen. So be, be watching those contracts. Yeah, certainly, certainly. Well, you know, kind of to wrap things up here, you know, one of the things that we want to leave kind of the audience with, especially the growers uh, that are attending this, uh, this uh, presentation is, you know, just some questions to keep in mind as, as you're going through this and, and you're being kind of bombarded as far as just what, what are you going to have to do to, to even participate, what changes you know, the question is there may be changes that it's just not economically sustainable. It, it may sound like a good deal as far as they'll pay you, but what's it gonna cost you to actually to comply? Uh, how much time and effort? Uh, you know, Michael, you've mentioned it, you know, Jacob, this, some of these commitments are up to 10 years. And, you know, the other question, can you use this data for other programs? I mean, Michael mentioned uh, being able to participate in some of these water quality credit programs, you want to make sure you're not knocked out or that data is not, you know, committed to someone else, uh, say on a carbon credit that you can't do that. And then, you know, there's a, the elephant in the room. If you've already implemented many of these sustainable practices, can you get paid? Because uh, for either what you've done in the past or even uh, will you be at a disadvantage to some of these that haven't implemented these uh, in the past? And, you know, uh, and so the other things to think about the, you know, open versus closed markets. We talked about some of those markets that are having strings attached to them and some very open markets that, that are probably going to be out there. 
The other question is what happens if, if you're trying to sign up uh, uh, land that you rent that uh, is, is uh, you have a three year rental agreement, but trying to sign up for 10 year carbon contracts is a problem. And so working through that, I think some land rents and lease rents, uh, land lease agreements are gonna basically start to address some of that because this is gonna be popping up. And the landlord may even get into the act where they sign the land up and you have to abide by it. And the other thing we mentioned is there's really no double dipping here. Uh, you can't just sell that carbon credit multiple times. So. As we kind of close, I'll let Michael just put his two cents as far as on some of these things, what he thinks. Uh, yeah, I think that, that that first bullet point up there really says it all in the sense of strings attached. And that, that that's not only is that entity trying to sell you another product, but it's also how are they using your data? And, yeah. and, and because most of the, the agreements that I've seen, it says that they can't use your individual farm, they can't use your name, but they can use your, your data in aggregate with other farmers. Right. And the reason behind them wanting to do that is what we call big mining or big data mining. And, and that fact, that's what we talk about across the many, many different industries is, is the, 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 uh, the unknowns or the, the questions that can be answered by mining big data sets. And, and that's largely what it's being used for. In most cases, they can't sell it to someone else, but that is something to watch out for in those contracts. Um, you know, I, I think you, you hit the nail right on the head with the fact that, that a lot of the contracts exceed a number of years greater than what a land lease is currently. Mm -hmm. and, and that has a lot of questions need to be answered there. And on the no double dipping, the no double dipping too, not only uh, means I can't sell my credits to different places, but it also has, I, I look at it as having a meaning in the sense of, can I participate in some sort of funding to help put in a cover crop and at the same time get the carbon credits for that acre. And that varies from place to place too. So again, it's, it's, it's confusing when you first approach this and it, it really takes some careful and, and some uh, long looking at a lot of different companies before I would choose to go uh, wherever I would to, to, to market my credits. Obviously. I think one of the things as we kind of leave this uh, and start to open up to question and answer here in the next couple of minutes. You know, for the audience, the, the Farm Journal has really done a good job as far as just uh, tracking uh, as some of these players are coming onto the market. So uh, just keep your eye out in the media. Just uh, do your due diligence, I think, as far as from what Michael has said, you know, being able to collect data. The key thing here is data, especially field activity data, cannot be recreated. And being able to have that history is very, very important. So keep your powder dry is our recommendation as you start to, to dip your toe in the water just a little bit, but don't go uh, whole hog right out of the gate. But certainly uh, you're going to have to do your due diligence and, and start collecting that data set to, to be more robust and scalable than you have in the past. So with that, you know, it's you know, our emphasis, be data ready. This is your farm, your time, and, and this is your game. Don't give it away to, to someone else in the marketplace. And as a question, you know, based upon, uh, you know, today's presentation, and you may have been thinking about this before, but do you see yourself participating in emerging markets, especially carbon, in the next 12 to 24 months? Uh, you know, I'll let you go ahead and, and answer that question. Just give a few minutes and then as we so that's you know obviously we're gonna see a continued increase so that's you know getting over the threshold of 50 percent so uh certainly that is amazing and then certainly want to give time here uh you know appreciate the opportunity to present you know, if there are questions, you can certainly contact us directly uh, at, at these email addresses and certainly, uh, you know, contact Illinois Soybean Association directly as well. They'll move forward, but we'll open it up right now to uh, Q&A uh, and back to Rachel. 
Thanks, Steve, and thank you, Jacob and Michael, for that informative presentation. We're now going to begin taking questions from the audience. So if you have a question, please go ahead and type it into that Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom window, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Steve, our first question that came in was actually in reference to your Jerry Maguire show me the money slide, where you said with the right practices, you could bank on average a ton of CO2 per acre. And the question is, is that total or per year? That is a per year. They're, they're looking at banking uh, uh, a ton of, you know, on average, a ton of carbon per year. That's obviously going to vary, but, uh, you know, a lot of these contracts are per year. Uh, you're signing up certain fields and, and certainly going to be a per year uh, payment for many of these. Now, obviously, like Michael and Jacob have both said, read the contract because you know you may not get paid on some of that until the end of say five years but uh it is it is usually uh you know estimated on a, on a per year basis at this point great thank you our next question i think is uh directed toward jacob but it is how is brant providing electronic field reports to the grower that does not have a farm mobile account uh, yeah, we're actually uh, in discussions right now with uh, the guys at uh, Farm Mobile to uh, figure out a way to export that in a more common format to be able to send to, you know, maybe it's a landlord of one of those growers. Um, uh, if they don't have an account, maybe work with them to where we can share that back and forth. Uh, we've got many different avenues where we can share data. Um, we're even looking at uh, a way we could maybe put that in a grower's My John Deere account, for example. Um, so yeah, work with your, you know, local retailer, uh, or if it's a brand location, uh, your salesman or get in contact with me as well. And, uh, we can definitely try to get that in your hands in a timely fashion. I think, uh, I'll add to that, you know, obviously on Farm Mobile, our, we're built on, on getting, data out almost more so than we are getting it in. I mean, it's very important as far as being able to share that data and protect the, the rights of that data uh, for, for the rightful owners. But being able to share that is, is paramount uh, to be able to scale, you know, especially, you know, someone the size of grants and be able to uh, uh, get in the hands of the right people. So Jacob's uh, headed down the right direction they're seeing that digital anchor uh, become very more important and, and more and more players wanting to, uh, to access that data. Okay, the next question is, what potential volatility is there for carbon market program payouts to increase or decrease? It's, I don't know, Michael, you wanna chime in there? Yeah, so I, I smiled or, or a little bit about that because I read a recent article by a company called McKinsey and, and Company and McKinsey and Company was looking at the sectors of industry that are purchasing these credits. And this was an international study uh, just to let everybody know. So it wasn't just the US alone, but that, that range of payments was anywhere from $5 a ton to over $100 a ton. So, it's hugely volatile right now, but in that volatility, I see the, uh, the, the chance that with time that there may be different, uh, I don't know how to put it, grades of credits that are sold as far as carbon is concerned. So let's say you are a producer that has been no-tilling for 20 years, that your credit on a carbon basis for adding a new practice may be worth more than somebody that is fairly new to a practice. Just with the idea that that uh, industry that is purchasing that is assured that you, you are committed to conservation practices because you've been doing one of those practices for an extended period of time. So it, it's hugely volatile right now. I think it'll settle down with time, obviously like any markets do. But uh, the, the, the value of that, that credit is largely in the eye of the beholder. So it's an industry sector, that company that's buying it, and just what their consumers are saying that they're looking for in that company. That's really what it comes back to is the consumer. 
and their demands, those millennials and, and other younger age groups that are saying is, hey, you need to reduce your carbon footprint. Yeah, and I think it's very important to note that, you know, obviously the more data or the better sets of data that you have, the, the better off you are to possibly participate in those, yes. those $100 you know, an acre uh, markets than you would be on, on the lower end. I mean, if you're an American Airlines writing a check for a scope one carbon credit, you're basically, you've got to be able to put up more than just us, something uh, written down on the backside of a napkin to, to do that. And uh, if they're going to be writing millions of dollars a check in, in checks to, to these carbon markets, they're going to actually want digital proof uh, that this did, did happen. So I think that's going to be a key uh, as we start to evolve in this marketplace. So. Okay, great. thank you. Under a traditional cash rent lease, do the carbon contracting rights default to the landowner or the farmer? That's good. Uh, I'll leave that to a, a lawyer on the, probably on the call. But I mean, typically, it's, it's a matter of who signs this contract, uh, uh, who's signing the contract, I mean, at the end of the day. And, and I know in some cases uh, with some of these entities that uh, you're contracting with, you're, you're saying that you've got that worked out. If you're the farmer and signing up uh, rented land, they're, you're basically attesting that you've, you've worked that out with the, uh, the landowner. Uh, prior and and that's part of that contract so that's that's going to be a very interesting evolution of how this gets navigated uh, on land that is is leased okay what percent of midwest farmers are keeping row crop records electronically today and what is the key barrier for those who have not adopted it yet you like that one jacob <laughs> you know, so we ask ourselves internally this question all the time. I mean, especially with, you know, the department that I'm in, uh, of course, we're wanting growers to adopt, you know, a digital electronic record of some of some type percentage wise. Um, I can only attest to, you know, our growers. Um, I would love to say it's 50 percent, but I think it's below that. Um, as far as the ones that I actually see come across my desk and, you know, our, our department, um, I bet you it's, you know, right around that 40% mark. Yeah. Uh, as far as the barrier, it's money. Uh, in my opinion, it's, you know, the cost of getting into that, you know, technology, uh, especially with the technology that is changing. Uh, and I'll, I'll give the shameless plug, uh, Farm Mobile is probably the uh, one of the most cost effective uh, of choices. So I've had growers uh, here in the past year or two uh, that say, you know what, I've never had a monitor in my combine, uh, don't have one in my planner. And I said, hey, why don't we give this a try uh, with Farm Mobile? And going on three years, that grower's never seen a, a yield monitor or a yield map. And now we've got the opportunity to do that and pretty inexpensive. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think that's a, that's a big question as far as, you know, how we're going to move that line. Um, the other, you know, holdback besides money is what we're going to use the data for. Yeah. So for how many years that we've been collecting data, those, you know, those early adopters have been collecting data and there really wasn't anywhere to really benefit from it besides, you know, if you're doing a variable rate, you bet. That was a, a home run. Uh, and, you know, we've been telling everybody, you know, you got to start somewhere at some point, you're going to wish you had that data from five years ago, from 10 years ago, you know, and these pop-up, you know, uh, opportunities like this, you know, those guys that have that historical data that they took the time and spent the money to uh, to record, I think those guys are going to benefit from a program like this. Yeah. Well, you're shaking your head, Michael. I, I give, give you a chance to chime in here because I think this is an important subject. Yeah. Obviously, we have a we have a first mile problem that still exists in this in precision ag and its collection of data. 
Yeah, I think so. I mean, there's so many different entities out there that have entered that space alone, you know, with field view, aggregable, granular, uh, you name it. Um, it. There's a lot of different entities that have entered that. And why have they entered it? Because they realize the value of that data. There's, there's, there's a dollar value to that data. Again, it comes back to that data mining. And, oh. and I think that that, that that is the cue that, that I would hope would draw other growers into it is the fact that it's an investment in it, it's like storing away money in the bank. It, it, yeah. it, it's, it's gaining interest while it's sitting there. And you need those multiple years of data to enter markets like this. And who know what other markets are to come yet? You know, yeah, and that, you that's just awesome. don't have a crystal ball, and and um, you know, so I, I think it's really important. Yeah, I, I've always said it's a four hundred one k, and it's not the 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 craps table table at Vegas in Vegas that that you're playing. I mean, this is this is the long game that that is needed to be played in this, and the sooner you start, the better off you'll be. All right. Well, that's all the time we have for questions today. If you have further questions, I think I speak for all panelists when I say feel free to reach out to them. Their, in, their contact information is right there on your screen. I want to take a moment to thank Steve, Jacob, and Michael for their informative presentation today. And thank you to our corporate sponsor, Farm Mobile, for sponsoring today's webinar. Thank you all for tuning in, and I hope you all have a great day.